So I have, well, actually, every time I pray that prayer and I say, rebuke us where we need to be rebuked, does anybody else feel like, ah, I hope it's the encouragement today? <laughs> That's why I always say that line, because it's a reminder to me, too, that when we present ourselves before God's word, sometimes it's encouragement, sometimes it's conviction. That said, it's been a little while since I opened with a bad joke, so I figured I would tell you one as we talk about our passage this morning. So uh, there was a guy who uh, found himself before St. Peter at the heavenly gates, and he was having a conversation with St. Peter, and St. Peter started to tell him what it was that was needed in order to get into heaven. And so he started to ask him some questions. He says, so uh, one of the things is, have, have you had a faithful life? Were you a part of a church? Were you involved in faith at all? And the guy's like, ah, and Peter said, ah, that's not good. So then he said, well, were there any good deeds that you did? Was there a neighbor that you loved really well? Is there anything you did nice for anyone? Did you give to charity? And the guy's like, ah, no. And Peter again said, ah, that's not good. And so Peter's looking a little frustrated and, and questioning whether or not there's anything that's going to happen here at this point. And he said, now, everybody does something nice at some point in their life. And so he's really searching, trying to find a way to help this guy. Everybody does something. Is there anything you can think of that maybe you did that was nice for someone else? And so the guy thinks for a second. And he said, yeah, actually, uh, one time I was leaving a grocery store, and I saw a woman that was attacked by a biker gang. And so I threw my bags down, and I jumped up, and I grabbed her purse back, and I handed it to her, and I started to confront the biker gang. And I went up to the biggest, meanest, baddest of the entire group, and I told him that it was cowardly, that it was mean, that he ought not to ever do that. And Peter's getting a little excited at this point. He's like, yeah, that, that's what I'm talking about. That's really kind. When did this happen? And he said, about 10 minutes ago. All right, thank you for laughing. I always appreciate, you know, when I waste that much time of talking about God's word, hopefully people will laugh. So this morning, we're actually going to talk about a passage. I've, I've been telling you as we've been going through the Gospel of Mark that Jesus does a lot of miracles. He does a lot of exciting teachings that draw people to him. But we're at a point in the Gospel where all that excitement is starting to turn into a realization of all the things that are going to happen as Jesus walks these final days, weeks, months, until his death. And so last week was really a transition in the Gospel of Mark where we talked about all these miracles and some of his teachings. And what we talked about in our passage last week was that Jesus now says, but the way this story is going to end is that I'm going to die that they're going to persecute me, that I'm going to be arrested, and you're going to watch as I die. And if you remember, Peter stands up, he's like, I'm not going to let that happen. And Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. These events are necessary for you to get to the promised life, the new life, the glorious life that I'm promising. And so in that vein, this passage is a continuation of what we'd call the harder teachings, where Jesus has celebrated the kingdom of God has arrived in his midst. There is great joy and there's great peace that is coming. But for those of us that want to follow him, the path of following him is not an easy one. It's challenging. And it will require us, as he said last week, to give up our lives, to pick up our own crosses in order to come and follow him. And so let's go ahead and begin and just read the passage, and then we'll kind of break it down and talk about it. If you have your Bibles, you can open up to Mark chapter 10, and we're going to read verses 17 to 31. And this passage is one that I know you've heard before, but it's about a man who comes to Jesus, a man of great wealth, and he asks a very simple question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus then explains it to him. So read along with me. It says, starting in verse 17, As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and mother. Teacher, he declared, all these I have kept since I was a boy. Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said, go sell everything you have and give to the poor, 
and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. At this the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were amazed at his words. But Jesus said again, Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were even more amazed and said to each other, Who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, With man this is impossible, but not with God. All things are possible with God. Then Peter spoke up, We have left everything to follow you. Truly I tell you, Jesus replied, No one who has left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for me and the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age. Homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and fields, along with persecutions, and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last first. So I told you, Jesus is moving into some hard teachings. And what's interesting about the way that Jesus talks is there's only one thing that Jesus talks about in all the Bible more than money. And that's the kingdom of God, which we spent a lot of time talking about in the Gospel of Mark as well. But the only thing, the number one thing that he spends most of his time talking about other than the kingdom of God is money. Money. It's something that makes us uncomfortable, particularly as citizens of one of the wealthiest countries, if not the wealthiest country, depending on what parameters that you use in the nation, or in the world, I'm sorry, that we are citizens, that most of us by worldly standards have exorbitant wealth. I mean, by a lot of standards that people use around the world, if if you have family income more than $30,000 a year, That puts you in the top 10% of wealth in the world. And yet our temptation often is to compare ourselves to people that might be of a similar social economic class than us or typically would compare ourselves to someone that might be slightly ahead of us. And so our self-identity has a way of saying, well, we don't have as much as so-and-so. And And yet we, we sit likely every single one of us by the world standards being rich or wealthy it's one of the reasons that jesus talks about wealth so much is because when we have stuff when we have things it's easy for us to feel secure in those things or to feel peace in those things or to presume that if we don't have all that we want that if we just had more of them then we would have the security that we desire or the peace that we desire. It's a hard teaching in the ancient world because people struggled with the same things that we often struggle with today. It's one sometimes it can feel awkward to talk about in church. There are all sorts of sins or brokenness that are a little more socially acceptable things that we're more quick to rail against. And what I encourage you, and I've said this multiple times as we go through Jesus' hard teachings, is do not, reading this passage, try to think of other people and how you wish they could read this passage. But as Jesus talks to us this morning, hear the God of the universe speaking to you in your time and place, in your seat, What might God be inviting you to give up? What might God be inviting you into? So let's just kind of make our way through this. The man comes to Jesus. We we get some context here of who he is. It says, a man runs up to him, fell on his knees before him, and he calls Jesus a good teacher. In the other gospels, we get a little more evidence. Some refer to him as a rich, young ruler. And so he's young, he's wealthy. He comes to Jesus, and it says he falls on his knees. He clearly believes that Jesus is someone significant, and he believes that Jesus is the one that might have an answer to his very first question. And so this morning, instead of giving you points, I'm just going to present to you a few of the things that Jesus says in the passage points to. So the first one is this question that he asks. 
What must I do to inherit eternal life? You can go to the next slide. What must I do to inherit eternal life? It's a question I think a lot of us ask. Isn't it a pretty basic question? We all desire to have eternal life. We might say we all desire to be in heaven. Well, what does it take? Another way that he's asking this question is, have I done enough? What are those things that are most important? And so Jesus responds first with this odd question, why do you call me good? Now, I would say that Jesus is responding with this question because he's trying to draw the gentleman into understanding what he's saying and who he truly believes Jesus is. Because Jesus follows it up by saying, no one is good except God alone. And he's begging the question, do you think that I'm God? Because if you do, then the hard teaching that I'm about to give you will be one that you will wrestle with and think about submitting to. Do you really think I'm good? Do you really think I'm God? And then he gives him a list of commandments. All the commandments he gives him come from, obviously, the Old Testament, the Ten Commandments. But they're the, ten com- they're the parts of the Ten Commandments that are focused on how you treat other people. Do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not give false testimony, do not defraud on your father and mother. The man, I imagine, kind of stands up a little more straight. (laughs) He declared, all these I have kept since I was a boy. You can almost hear the optimism in his voice. Check, 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 check. Jesus looked at him, and the second part of what it says is really important. It says, Jesus looked at him and loved him. Now, often when we think about love, we think of giddy feelings. I usually say this nearly every time I do a wedding, is that when we think about love, we think of giddy feelings. When I'm around someone, when I meet that significant other, I want those butterfly feelings, and that's love. But that's not biblical love. That may be an aspect of it, but it's just the beginning. Biblical love is a commitment to another's good. And there's a difference. I can be committed to someone's good even when it doesn't feel very awesome. When in my marriage, sometimes we're frustrated with one another, we don't wake up in the morning and say, yeah, it's awesome to be married to you. but we choose the other's good. And so here, Jesus is about to tell something to this man that is not gonna feel very awesome. But he's gonna speak truth to him because he is so committed to his good. He so loves him, he so wants what's best for him. He says this, one thing you lack, go sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. He says, then come follow me. Go sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, then come follow me. Jesus has looked into this man's heart, and he has seen that one of the greatest barriers in his life to giving everything, as we talked about last week, of picking up his own cross and coming to follow Jesus, is he's got all this stuff that he'd want to bring with him. And all that stuff slows him down. It weighs him down. It competes for his love for Jesus. Twenty two, at this the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. At that point of decision that he has, he sees both of what Jesus is inviting him to and also what he's relying on. And his head is dejected because he knows he doesn't want to give it up. He knows that he rests in that security that he has in those things. Jesus goes on to explain, 
Jesus looked around, he says to his disciples, and many of these things that are happening with various people, the disciples are kind of there as a crowd, and they're watching, and they're studying, and they're around him in this moment, and it says he looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. Which is the next slide I want you to think about this morning. How hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. Now hear me, how we began, is don't wiggle out of that not applying to, you, applying to you. Don't spin your head around, don't think about people in the media or movie stars in Hollywood. But hear that as an invitation for us to do the own self, our own self-examination of what role wealth or money or things plays in our own allegiances in this world. Where do we believe that peace comes from? Where do we believe that security comes from? Dana and I, for close to a decade, we were in an adoption process. And our two youngest kids are adopted. Those are long processes. And over that entire decade, pretty much, we were saving money in order to, to pay the next bill. And they would come due over time. And I can remember multiple times in that process where our savings account would hit zero and I would feel terrified, fearful, anxious written, worried, and I'd be searching, like, what can I sell? You know, how can I come up with more income in order to get the savings back up to pay the next bill? And I would express that anxiety to Dana and she'd say, I don't know what you're worried about. Isn't it awesome that we had everything that was necessary to pay that last bill? And every single time we had one of those conversations, I felt extremely convicted. Where did my security, where did my peace come from? I remember another instance a few years ago where I had a, a car that had 190,000 miles on it. I loved it. I thought it was a fantastic car. And, but I had all these things that I thought, man, I need to upgrade this car sometime as soon as I can. You know, the seat was torn and um, the check engine light had been on for three years. I checked it out, it was fine, but it had been on for a long time. I chose not to have the repair done. And I remember one day I was working as a mentor for these young guys that had made some poor decisions while they were in high school. And one of the guys needed a ride home from the class that we had. So I said, yeah, sure, no problem. And I quickly pick up everything in my car like everybody does, you know, if someone's going to be riding with you. And he jumps in, and he's just looking around inside my car. And his eyes are just huge. And he's like, man, this, this car is amazing. And he said, I don't think I've ever been in a car this nice. And what he meant by it, it had leather seats in it. And it had some chrome trim on it. And again, in that moment, and I'm sure you've had these moments too, where all of a sudden your perspective radically changes. And you see something in a way that you'd never seen it before. How do we understand the role of money in our own life? This is a good season to think about that. Many of you probably are gathering documents for tax season. You can look back at 2019 and you typically can see exactly what you invested in others. Or said a different way, you can look back and see of the income that I received, how much did I keep for myself? It's a subtly different question I think has been helpful for me and also led to a great amount of conviction. Not just how much do I give away or how much do I invest in others, but how much of my income did I choose to keep for myself? And if our income increases over years, do we think about not just giving away more, but keeping less? Now, all of these questions aren't necessarily directly connected to inherit eternal life. But they are getting at, for Jesus, one of the things that we often worship instead of God, instead of Jesus. 
The disciples were amazed at his words, but Jesus said again, Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. What does Jesus mean? It's hard. Camels, biggest animal that they would have known around them in the time, biggest reference point that Jesus could have made, eye of the needle, about as small a hole as anyone could have imagined. Jesus often uses metaphors or allegory to make a point, and he's saying it's hard. And it's hard because money and wealth are such an allure. He goes on, the disciples were even more amazed and said to each other, who then can be saved? Now there's a couple, there's some context behind what Jesus is saying here and how the disciples are responding. In the ancient world, and I would argue still in our modern world, people presume that if people had great wealth, it was because God must have shown them divine favor, that they must be hyper blessed. And so the disciples are a little baffled here because they presume that if someone had great wealth, it meant they were actually closer to God. And so Jesus is helping them to understand that this isn't the case. Who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, with man this is impossible, but not with God. All things are possible with God. Peter said to him, we have left everything to follow you. I tell you the truth, Jesus replied, no one who has left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for me in the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much. This is where Jesus is taking this example with this one man and talking about money and wealth and blowing it up to help us to understand that his ultimate point isn't just about money, but that money is a symptom of idolatry and worshiping things other than Jesus. And it might be the most pervasive example, but that ultimately the point that Jesus is trying to make is that the only way human beings can be saved is through Jesus Christ. Our money cannot save us. Now we never use that language to describe it, but we absolutely use words like security and peace and comfort and stability. And they feel subtle. But remember, joy, these are words that God uses to say that these are available in me. And to the extent that we're seeking to find those things in anything other than Jesus. Jesus is inviting us to trust him. Trust and lean into him. And the apostles are crying out, saying, we've lost so much. And Jesus says, yes, this is where true salvation is found, in him, in his love and his care. Now, I realize that this is hard, hard to wrestle with. It feels personal, feels challenging. Many of us wake up and we see the news and the way that we measure the success of our nation is by the stock market, whether it went up or down. And so we're just wrapped up in questions about money. But I want, to, I want you to hear Jesus' word as an invitation, an opportunity to rest fully in him. He invites us to be in relationship with him. He invites us to find freedom in him. And he assures us that to the extent that we aren't as reliant upon our stuff, we actually will have greater joy and greater peace and greater security. And he reminds us that for good or bad, our life in this physical world is temporary. And there will be a day where those things aren't going anywhere with us. And we don't know that day. And he's drawing us into this question of saying, what will you invest in? What will you spend your time in? And he's inviting us to rest in him fully. 
And then he ends in 31, but many who are first will be last and the last first. He reminds us that this entire world will be flipped on its head. And many of those people that seem to be last according to the standards that the world is using will indeed be first in the kingdom of God because of their reliance on him. Let me just end. I'm going to end with a quote, but just let me end with this encouragement too. The goal of God's word is not to let you feel like you're spinning your wheels in guilt. Okay? So if some of you are sitting there like, gosh, I feel guilty. I don't know what to do. Remember that God's word is not intended to encourage us and to convict us. And the difference between just spinning in guilt and conviction is that conviction propels us to something. And so if you are feeling convicted in any way, ask the next question is, well, how can I take one step further into leaning on God? How can I... Increase just slightly this year when I'm setting a goal for 2020 what I invest in others rather than what I keep? How can I take one additional risk with my generosity this year? How can I trust God a little more deeply in my financial planning or my retirement or Whatever it is that God might be leading you to. If you feel convicted, ask that next question. Well, where? Where do I take a step back towards you? And remember this, that every single one of us are on a journey. We bring up these issues not as litmus tests for our relationship with Jesus, but as an opportunity for us to think about what our relationship looks like. Are we leaning into God? Do we believe that Jesus truly is our Lord, our master, our rescuer, the one that invites us more deeply to experience his peace and joy? Let me just end with this G.K. Chesterton quote. He says, there are two ways to get enough. One is to continue to accumulate more and more. The other is to desire less. To desire less. Now again, in our world, in our culture, it seems wrong to desire less. You know, consumerism is the opposite of desiring less. Most of the commercials that exist are intended to help us desire more. I joke about this all the time, but it's desired when you get the iPhone 19 to make you want the iPhone 20 instantly because there's one new feature, you know, one new app you can install. And yet think about the peace the freedom that we're able to live into when we feel like we have everything in Christ and don't need anything else in the world to get the joy, the peace, the contentment that's promised to us. Let's pray together and then we'll move to a time of communion. Father, I uh, feel uncomfortable at times standing up in front of other people and reading a passage like this. Father, we are on a journey together. You speak to us in ways that make us uncomfortable. You speak to us in ways that sometimes convict us. And when we're honest with ourselves or when I'm honest with myself, sometimes we can be afraid that when we would have an interaction with you, would we be in the same position as this rich young guy? who comes genuinely seeking relationship with you and wanting an eternal life, but wondering whether or not he's too entangled in the things of this world. Father, encourage us that you are enough and invite us to more fully lean into that relationship. Help us to be specific. Help us to think of next steps this week and help us to be honest with ourselves as we work out our relationship with you and continue to experience the fullness of what you offer. In all things, we pray in your name. Amen.